law nerds, the way the live chat and my social media blew up with you asking me to cover this lawsuit is unlike almost any other lawsuit I have covered over the last three and a half years. So today I am going to break down the Leah Remini versus Scientology lawsuit. And I'm really going to be looking into not the background of Scientology, but what these nine causes of actions are, the remedy being sought, what that means, what happens next. Yes, there's a court date already on the calendar. We're going to talk about that and what this discovery battle might be like because Scientology is going to fight to keep internal records internal and I'm sure that Remini's side is going to be fighting not just for every deposition that they can get, but to get those internal communications turned over the way that would normally happen in discovery. So today, that's what we are diving into. All right, people, let's do it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Thank you to our partner, Green Chef, for making episodes like today's possible. Green Chef also makes dinner possible at my house every single week, but especially now that we are getting back to school. I know it's early but it's still happening. Green Chef is a CCOF certified meal kit company and makes eating well easy with menu plans to fit every lifestyle. Whether you want keto meals or paleo, vegan or vegetarian, or just something that is quick and easy, Green Chef has you covered. And they deliver it all right to your door, ready to be made with really easy to follow recipe cards. They also have grab and go breakfast. We love the egg bites. And it's a really fantastic way to get your family out the door quickly. And for Emily Show listeners, we have 50% off and free shipping for you with Green Chef. So go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker50 and use code emilybaker50 for 50% off plus free shipping. I can't wait to see what meals you pick. There are new meals to choose from every single week. And you will find out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Let's get into today's episode. So on August 2nd, 2023, actress Leah Remini, who had left Scientology over 10 years ago, sued the Church of Scientology, its leader, David Miscavige, and Religious Technology Center, Inc. We're going to talk about who the parties are. We're going to talk about what the nine causes of action are. I'm going to try to not say nine like I'm in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I'm going to try not to say nine times a million times, but but I might. Um, also, one of the law firms involved in this is Motley Rice LLC from Last Names of the Lawyers Involved. I will also try not to say Motley Crew because we are covering their lawsuit here as well. So with all of those um, notes, we're going to jump in to looking at this lawsuit. And yes, Scientology has responded and come out swinging. Maybe we should just start with what Scientology said about this lawsuit before we jump into the lawsuit, because I think it gives you an overview of their perspective in the entire thing. And I will remind you that during this, I am not going to go page by page. This is a 64 page complaint. If you are interested in the background of Scientology and kind of how we got here, Leah Remini posted that on her Substack, and I am going to include those links so you can see what she said about this lawsuit yourself and download a copy of the lawsuit from her if you're interested in reading every single thing listed. It is a ton of background information going particularly, I think, to the civil harassment and stalking causes of action here, but to show how those acting on behalf of Scientology are part of these defendants, the leader and the Church of Scientology. 
So this statement is coming from Scientologynews.org with the logo of the Church of Scientology International, which is a trademarked logo, from August 3rd, 2023. And I am going to read directly from the statement for those of you not watching me do it over on YouTube. Church of Scientology statement. Well, at least we know what it is. This lawsuit is ludicrous and the allegations pure lunacy. So if you're wondering if this case is going to settle, my gut response to that is negative Ghost Rider. The pattern is full. Am I allowed to make Tom Cruise movie quotes in a Church of Scientology lawsuit podcast? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. It goes on to say, Rimini spreads hate and falsehoods for a decade and is now offended when people exercise their right to free speech, exposing her for what she is, an anti-free speech bigot. If you are offended by the word bigot, this probably is not the podcast episode for you because it comes up a ton in this lawsuit. It is a word Rimini alleges is used quite frequently by the Church of Scientology to attack and detract from those that speak out against them. It goes on to say Remini's complaints are like an anti-Semite complaining about the Jewish Anti-Defamation League for exposing the anti-Semites' bigotry and propaganda. It goes on to say Remini's obsession with attacking her former religion by spreading falsehoods and hate speech has generated threats of and actual violence against the church and its members as evidenced by multiple criminal convictions of individuals poisoned by Remini's propaganda. Some of this goes directly to the allegations of defamation here that you will see as we get into Remini's complaint. All the while, Remini has profited handsomely from her fabrications through the sale of hate books, hate podcasts, and paid for tabloid hate television. It's a lot. That's a lot goes on to say now that Remini's propaganda has been exposed, Remini has spun entirely out of control by filing a frivolous lawsuit attempting to stop free speech exposing her false propaganda. Remini's decade of harassment and fabrications are all coming back to haunt her. If you thought they were going to double down and say she deserves it, that's that's where they're at with this. But if you've paid attention to other cases involving the Church of Scientology in any way, um, you've probably seen that this is part of that playbook of uh, discrediting those that speak against them. If Remini can no longer get a job, she has nobody to blame but herself. Obviously, everyone in Hollywood now knows what we already knew, that Remini is a horrible person and toxic to so many who have the misfortune to come into contact with her. This is in their official statement. It goes on to say, while Remini was in the Church of Scientology, she had to restrain her antisocial traits. She said so herself that Scientology was the only thing keeping her quote unquote monster at bay. The church is not intimidated by Remini's latest act of blatant harassment and attempt to prevent truthful free speech. If Remini does not believe in free speech, then she should consider emigrating to Russia. Yeah, that's what it says. I know. What's interesting is when we go through the lawsuit, you will see that the lawsuit lays out the fact that the church will use the words particularly hate, uh, bigot, antisocial, and others when they allege that the church is attacking people who speak out against the church, which is going to be very interesting as we get into it because then when they released this statement, I was like, this statement is everything, <laughs> essentially, she said that it would be. It was just like, it called it. Just She called it in the lawsuit that this is how they were going to continue to come after her and to say that she, in fact, is the problem. So let's get into this lawsuit and its nine causes of action. All right. Complaint for damages, demand for jury trial. Four, one, civil harassment. Two, stalking under the California Code, 1708.7. Three, intentional infliction of emotional distress, that IIED claim. Four, tortious interference with contractual relationship. 
Five, intentional interference with prospective economic advantage. Six, defamation and defamation per se. Seven, defamation by implication, false light. Nine, declaratory judgment, California Code Procedure, uh, C California CCP. 1060. So we're going to go through all of those specifically. We're going to give a little bit of an overview. This is what's alleged at the beginning of the lawsuit. Beginning in the mid-1960s, the Church of Scientology, through its founder and leader, L. Ron Hubbard, institutionalized a series of retaliatory activities to be taken against any individual, organization, business, or government that Scientology deems to be an enemy or suppressive person. Reflected in hundreds of published directives, Office of Special Affairs, OSA, Network Orders, HCOPL, paren, Hubbard Communication Office Policy Letters, HCOBS's, Hubbard Communications Office Bulletins, and Executive Directives. These policies mandate obliteration of Scientology's enemies and are commonly referred to as attackers under the banner of what is termed fair game. So Rimini's lawyers go out to lay out that she has become fair game, and they talk about how Scientology uses their enemies list. It goes on to say suppressive persons are also referred to, among other names, as attackers, merchants of chaos, merchants of fears, antisocial personalities, anti-Scientologists, psychotics, squirrels, cancer of society, criminals, and bigots. These classifications laid out by L. Ron Hubbard's directives justify the destruction of suppressive persons. One does not need to be a Scientologist or former Scientologist to be on Scientologist's quote-unquote enemies list. It then goes on to say that suppressive acts include reporting crimes to law enforcement or government agencies, advocating for victims of Scientology or quote public disavowal of Scientology or Scientologists, writing anti-Scientology letters to the press or giving anti-Scientology or anti-Scientologist evidence to the press or testifying as a hostile witness against Scientology in public. We saw a lot of this discussed in the Danny Masterson trial and how much evidence of Scientology would come in, how much it wouldn't, the fact that the church and part of the teachings of the church, and I refer to it as the church because saying Scientology a million times really makes it hard for me to keep saying the word. I don't know why it's difficult for me to say, um, but speaking out against the church and reporting things to law enforcement was specifically against what they're allowed to do, and any reports to police could wind them in the sites of Scientology where they are then targeted the way Leah Remini is saying that she was targeted. So it's it's part of that case in that explaining to a jury why victims took so long to report to law enforcement, they need to understand what the repercussions would be for them within this church. In talking about the history of Scientology and this playbook, they say that one Los Angeles Superior Court judge observed that, quote, in addition to violating and abusing its own members' civil rights, the organization over the years with its, quote, unquote, fair game doctrine has harassed and abused those persons not in the church whom it perceives as enemies, footnote 16, which cites... Church of Scientology v. Armstrong, Memorandum of Intended Decision, Los Angeles Superior Court, June 20th, 1984. It then quotes another case that says, another opinion summarized a sample of Scientology's recent fair game tactics. Plaintiff alleged Scientology's agents committed the following acts against them, surveilled them, hacked their security systems, filmed them, chased them, hacked their email, killed and attempted to kill their pets, tapped their phones, incited others to harass them, threatened to kill them, broke their locks, broke into their cars, ran them off the road, posted fake ads purporting to be from them soliciting anal sex from strangers, broke their windows, set the outside of their home on fire, went through their trash, and poisoned the trees in their yards. This conduct was alleged to be pursuant to Scientology's policies and procedures, According to plaintiff's complaint, Scientology's directives are that suppressive persons are to be silenced by whatever means necessary. Scientology instructs members, quote, to damage the person's professional reputation, file frivolous lawsuits, and harass and surveil, quote, the enemy. Scientology's policies and procedures encourage and or instruct followers to ruin the individual utterly. 
That's footnote 17 from Bixler versus Superior Court for California 2022, and then cites that. Um, and it says, noted, cited for references to factual allegations only and not court holding, which makes me wonder what the holding is. But these are the allegations from another plaintiff against the church saying, this is what was done to me, which echoes a lot of what we will see here from Rimini is that this is a targeted and thorough campaign to truly and utterly destroy people and silence them. That is what's being alleged in all of this lawsuit. They say, quote, here defendants have undertaken a campaign to ruin and destroy the life and livelihood of Leah Remini, a former Scientologist of nearly 40 years, a two-time Emmy award-winning producer, actress, and New York Times bestselling author, after she was deemed a suppressive person and declared fair game by Scientology in 2013, when she publicly departed the church, a suppressive act as laid out by Scientology directives. And it goes through the fact that for the past 10 years, she has been, quote, stalked, surveilled, harassed, threatened, intimidated, has been the victim of intentional, malicious, and fraudulent rumors via hundreds of Scientology-controlled and coordinated social media accounts that exist solely to intimidate and spread misinformation. Scientology has elevated the reach of some of those posts by using its tax-exempt funds to pay social media companies like Twitter to, quote, promote those posts. I mean, anybody can pay social media to promote a post by paying to promote these posts and elevate them on Twitter. Defendants demonstrate that these posts are not the work of a rogue Scientologist, but a part of a coordinated campaign to follow a long held policy to destroy remedy, which is interesting because the church is being sued here. So saying the church is using its own fund, not saying like, Oh, it's just our followers, right? It's just our followers doing this and it's their free speech to say what they want. Go sue each individual who said something showing that church funds are connected here is going to help Remini argue that those who are doing this are not just individuals, that they are agents or employees of the church. And this is the church taking these actions, not an individual Twitter account. It goes on to allege that defendants have also incessantly harassed, threatened, intimidated, and embarrassed Remini's family members, friends, colleagues, business associates, causing her to lose personal relationships, business contracts, and other business opportunities and that that has caused her ongoing economic harm, has forced her to endure a new but never normal life in which Scientology's surveillance, abuse, and lies are the punishing, inescapable daily cost of exercising her First Amendment right and moral duty to speak out about Scientology's conduct. Scientology's policies regarding suppressive persons and fair game are not religious doctrine. They are old school mob style tactics, modernized, amplified, and weaponized by Scientology's far reaching network, which goes beyond just social media. So you can understand why people might not want to speak up against the Church of Scientology if they are inside the church and see these things happening to others that leave. You can see why so many choose to stay silent because a lot of people would not have not only the fortitude to withstand this, but the financial ability to withstand what Remini is alleging here. They identify the parties with, of course, the plaintiff being Leah Remini, the defendant Church of Scientology Corporation, and assert that it operates in California. This is being um, litigated in Los Angeles, that the company licenses all the intellectual property and the names for Scientology, et cetera, that the Religious Technology Center is a corporation that does business as part of Scientology and it's their technology and they operate under uh, Miscavige's direction. Then defendant uh, David Miscavige, um, an individual resident of Los Angeles, is the chairman of the board of the RTC and de facto leader in all aspects of the named defendants, controlling and directing the activities of all defendants and entities herein, it alleges. As we get into the factual allegations, they give a very thorough background of the church, its history, um, and the history of these policies and practices that are being alleged, and then gets into the background of Leah Remini, which if you have read her book, listened to any of her interviews, um, seen the things that she has produced, she talks about the fact that her mother joined Scientology when she was young and then pulled her into Scientology at the age of 13, taking her out of formal schooling and moving her into Scientology where she was living, working, and being educated 
outside of a formal or traditional school setting. She says in this that Scientology was her primary caretaker and she was a member for over 35 years. It states that Miss Remini estimates she spent over $5 million over the course of her lifetime as a Scientologist. These funds were spent on her so-called spiritual enlightenment and those of her family members and friends. Approximately half of her funding was for services that she purchased as from any other business. So if you go to get a massage or pay for therapy, it's funds in exchange for service. But they say that Ms. Remini's donations also included giving to the International Association of Scientologists, the IAS, for which there is no exchange of services. The IAS is known as David Miscavige's war chest. Scientologists are required to prepay for their services. And after Remini was declared a suppressive person, she was unable to obtain repayment of monies she had in her and her family's Scientology accounts. Yeah, it, I, it seems that a refund policy is maybe um missing here it goes on to say that while remini was a scientologist giving millions of dollars to the church and serving as a public face for the church recruiting people individually to join helping move other scientologists along their bridge their kind of path of of the church donating to outside groups at the behest of scientology she frequently was held up as an example of a model scientologist and praised repeatedly for her contributions she was awarded commendations by david miscavige tom cruise and by the very people who later attacked her in scientology produced videos despite repeatedly having been asked to appear in scientology videos herself as soon as she left and spoke out against the church, she was labeled by the organization she supported financially as an untrustworthy apostate, as has been the case for staff members, Sea Org members, and others who have left. She alleges that the campaign to destroy her began in 2006, seven years before she publicly left the church in the summer of 2013. And then she describes the background, and they make clear that she's describing it solely to provide context for the attacks on her after she left. And this all stems from the wedding of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. What's interesting to me is there is a footnote in this lawsuit that indicates that all allegations Remini has during the time she was a member of the church are actually in arbitration because the onboarding agreement or the church agreement has an arbitration provision. I don't know of a church that requires you to sign an arbitration provision when you join the organization. I mean, I've not been a member of many religions. I mean, just, just the one kind of, but I don't, that doesn't strike me as normal that you would have an arbitration clause. And by that, I mean, arbitration, like you would see in an employment contract, but that pulls it out of the public courts and places it with a private mediator. Everything is done outside of the view of the public. Court records are public records. Arbitration is not. It's binding like you went to court, but it's not public. Before we talk all about the Tom Cruise, Katie Holmes wedding, we need to take a minute to thank our sponsor. Thank you to our sponsor, Jenny Kane, for your support on this episode. Jenny Kane is your one-stop shop for home essentials. Not only do they have handcrafted furniture, but they also have the little finishing touches to spruce up your space or help it change between season. And then you can check out pillows or the farmhouse throw, which is luxurious, but still lightweight. Jenny Kane also has high-end kitchen essentials. So if you're finding yourself cooking more, well, maybe now's the time to get a few more things that, that you love for around the kitchen. With pieces starting at $25, there's something for everyone. And if you want to look at their handcrafted furniture, they also have a membership program where you can get the biggest discount on furniture. But I've got a discount for you because you're a listener of The Emily Show. You can get 15% off your first order at jennykane.com slash home with code Lawnard. That's 15% off your first order at Jenny Kane, J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com slash home promo code Lonard. All right, go find your forever pieces. Let's get back to today's episode. In 2006, Remini and her husband attended the wedding of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes in Italy. Cruise, Miscavige's best friend, is essentially second in command in the church. It is a high crime to criticize him in any way. 
In 2004, Ms. Cabbage told an audience of Scientologists at a gala in England that Cruz was the most dedicated Scientologist I know. The Cruz Holmes wedding was billed within Scientology as the wedding of the century. Because of Mr. Cruz's status within the church and how important the event was, Remini was shocked to discover that Ms. Cabbage's wife, Michelle Shelley, was nowhere to be found. Shelley held the title of assistant to chairman of the board. The assistant to the regional manager, like that. Assistant to chairman of the board. And her job was to constantly record everything he said so that a team of secretaries could later transcribe his words and orders for dissemination throughout the church. When Remini asked a group of executives and Tom Cruise's personal handlers, where is Shelley? She was immediately admonished by the group, despite the fact that she and Shelley were good friends. She said she witnessed other behavior at the wedding that set off red flags for her, including unethical contacts between various executives and others at the wedding, which she understood to be forbidden by Scientology teachings. While in Italy, Remini called her Scientology assistant and asked her to type up a series of internal reports that Remini was taught to write, known as knowledge reports or KRs. This is just like informing on people. So all the way that this is described is basically I saw this person talk to this person. I saw this person do this. I saw all these people do these things. So within the church, it seems from these allegations that you are being watched by others in the church. And if you're not acting in accordance with the church, that someone else will write you up. Yep. It alleges that from a young age, Remini had been brainwashed into believing that filing reports like this, she was helping Scientology and saving her religion. When she returned to LA from the wedding, she was ordered to go to Clearwater, Florida to the Flag Land Base Building, also known as FLAG. FLAG is considered the spiritual headquarters of Scientology where Scientologists receive top level services that cannot be obtained anywhere else. She was told that she could receive the services she had planned on getting while there, but she would undergo a quick quote unquote ethics cycle. That purportedly quick ethics cycle was one of her life's worst nightmares. It then goes on to describe the fact that she was there for months, put through a process that cost her hundreds of thousands of dollars and nearly led to her having a psychotic breakdown. It goes on to allege that after months of psychological torture, Remini was nearly to the point of a psychotic breakdown and she finally gave in, rescinded all her reports and admitted that she was the problem in this situation in parentheses, despite it not being true. She was finally allowed to leave Flag and return to LA, where she was forced to lie to her colleagues, friends, and family about what happened while she was in Florida. She was made to make amends at Flag, not only to Miss Cabbage, but to Tom Cruise. She was forced to donate money to name a seat in a theater after Surrey Cruise and to raise money for donation to Scientology causes led by Tom Cruise. After reports of terrible abuse emerged from Scientology's international base, Golden Era Productions in Riverside County, Remini endured another six months of punishments for looking on the internet and asking questions about the abuse. After her punishment, Remini resigned from Scientology in 2013. After leaving Scientology, Remini filed a missing person report on Shelley Miscavige, who has not been seen in public for 17 years. They then describe Remini's leaving Scientology and what the kind of fair game playbook is, the fact that uh, websites were put up uh, to discredit her, to say negative things about her. She's alleging that those things were done to, um, to discredit the things she was saying after she left. It alleges that to discredit Remini's truthful public comments regarding defendants, Defendants also used and manipulated Remini's estranged and now deceased father and his third wife to make false statements about Remini, including that she is a liar, that she only wanted her name in the news, and she would not help to pay for his cancer treatments, that she turned her back on her half-sister when she was in the hospital, that she ransacked her dying grandmother's apartment, and that she has no morals. These false statements were posted to websites created and controlled by defendants and continue to be promoted or reposted by Scientology. In 2015, Remini released Troublemaker, Surviving Hollywood and Scientology, 
a memoir exposing the church's abusive conduct, and that went on to become a National Times bestseller. Remini's critical and successful memoir further escalated defendants' abusive tactics against her, against her, and then they describe in the lawsuit that in 2015, she was being surveilled and followed while in New York and while doing other press appearances with regard to and in connection with this book. They then outline what happened during the award-winning A&E documentary series, Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath, and talked about what was in there, the awards that it won, and how that further amplified the harassment against Remini. The lawsuit alleges that during the series between November 16th and February 19th, defendants designed an operation to organize and force practicing Scientologists to write at least 500 letters seeking the cancellation of the show. The letters were sent to the network heads at A&E, the CEO of Disney, and innumerable advertisers and sponsors of the series, including Disney, Yahoo, Nissan, Coca-Cola, Nestle, and Expedia, just to name a few. And this was 2016, 2019, but you've seen, I'm sure, in the lawsuits that we've covered that these types of campaigns going after advertisers can work and I think are even more effective today. I think companies with how fast and prolific social media is, more so than in 2019, companies will back away um, from projects very quickly, lest the company take a massive hit on social media or in the public or in their bottom line for doing something that some consider distasteful or disfavored or um, problematic or whatever it is. It goes on to list all of the actions that they're alleging that were taken to discredit the Aftermath series, to attack its sponsors, to attack Remini's appearance on late night television and others, that she was consistently being accused of inciting hate crimes with this series saying that in 2016, defendants well aware of the falsehoods being leveled at Remini accused Remini in tweets and on their website of causing a man named Brandon Reisendorf, whose parents were former Scientologists, to throw a rock through a window at the LA Office of Scientology. Mr. Reisendorf, who was forced to disconnect from his brother and parents, was in the midst of a mental health crisis. Scientology policies ban any sort of psychiatric or psychological treatment. It goes on to say that both he and his family have stated publicly that Remini had nothing to do with it, yet Scientology continues to promote that even knowing that it's false. They go on to lay out allegations against Remini that her and the film incited the murder of a 24-year-old Taiwanese Scientologist in its Australia headquarters, where he was working as a security guard at the time. They then lay out the pervasive social media attacks against Leah Remini and the things that are are being said generally on uh, social media about her, some of the websites created to continue to promote those um, statements. And a lot of these go back well outside the statute of limitations. Some of these go all the way back into, you know, 2016, 2017, things in 2023 are going to be actionable things back to 2022 can be actionable but things in uh 2017 will not be under this they then talk about interference with an iheart media contract on april 13th 2018 remini entered into a contract and profit sharing agreement with iheart media uh, plus entertainment inc for the purpose of producing a podcast on iheart radio the contract was signed by remini and the, and I heart on May 1st, 2020, they executed an amendment to the agreement where Remini was producing two podcasts, one, a weekly chat podcast, and the second, a weekly podcast about Scientology. The contract gave I heart the option to renew each of the two podcasts for an additional two seasons. And those contracts were signed in May of 2020. They talked about the podcast called Scientology Fair Game. On March 4th, 2022, as part of its fair game campaign and in order to derail her podcast, they say defendants directed and controlled the publication of an article at freedommag.org claiming that iHeartRadio, quote, allows Remini in obscenity-laced and abusive language to insult, defame, and demean Scientologists. Obscenity-laced. 
well, fuck. Is that the problem? Is it the obscenity? They go on to say the article details the measures taken at the direction of the defendants to interfere with and terminate the contract with iHeart. Defendants openly admit that they called and emailed iHeart Media's executive vice president and chief communications officer, producer, and podcast audio editor in an attempt to prevent Remini's podcast from airing. Defendants even took credit for advertisers pulling their advertisement from the podcast. So when you're like, Emily, you said there was an intentional interference with contractual relations, this, yes, this. When you know someone has a contract and intentionally intercede with their contract to have it terminated, that is the underlying heart of that cause of action. It then goes into an audio boom contract saying on August 1st, 2022, Remini entered into a contract with audio boom to be the exclusive audio advertising sales representative for the Scientology fair game podcast for a year. The contract was signed by Remini and Stuart last, who is the CEO of audio boom on August 3rd at the direction of defendants stand, which is an organization detailed elsewhere in this complaint sent a letter to the CEO informing him that Audio Boone will soon be syndicating the hate podcast of two rabid anti-Scientologists. The letter goes on to explain that when the podcast was last running, we reached out to companies to inform them that this was the defamation and bigotry that they were paying for through their advertising. We heard back from the chief communications and marketing officers from Verizon to eBay confirming their ads would no longer be running on this quote unquote hate podcast. The podcast shortly thereafter lost all commercial advertising. Audio boom advertisers deserve the decency of being informed. You intend to identify their brands with defamation and hate. We will be so informing them. The letter is signed by 39 Scientologists and was sent to the CFO, COO, Director of Operations and Communications, and the VPs of Audio Boom. On August 10th, 2022, at the direction of defendants, there was a letter sent to the US CEO of one of Audio Boom's advertisers addressing the podcast, stating that, quote, we trust that like Verizon, eBay, State Farm, and countless other companies, this kind of dehumanizing, hateful content violates your ad buying guidelines and could not be further from your brand values. Audio Boom syndicates hate. Please pull your advertising from this platform. On August 18th, the chief content officer of Audio Boom sent the following to agents of Miss Remini. Stanley.org has been contacting Audio Boom's advertisers saying that we're promoting hate as a company by working with Fair Game. They've sent six emails to the CEO of Pretty Litter alone, a client not even associated with Fair Game. Are you aware of this and has Fair Game been impacted by this before? From the trailer that was just released, it alludes that this may have been the case at iHeart. So this again is that direct um, insertion into a existing contractual relationship. And it goes further into detailing that the companies at least told Leah Remini what was going on and said, Hey, this is the communication that we're getting so that she has a leg to stand on when she brings these allegations, the allegations that we are getting to now. Count one is civil harassment, civil harassment only really allows you to get the action restrained. This is incorporating all of the above, but saying that defendant's course of conduct, because it can't be one thing, it has to be a course and pattern of conduct, is but not limited to surveilling and stalking plaintiff, sending Scientology operatives to break into Remini's gated community, stealing her personal residential mail, vandalizing her mailbox, planting and or attempting to plant spyware in close proximity to her home, sending harassing correspondence to her and others, including business associates and sponsors regarding her creating a social media smear campaign against her that includes false and malicious accusations. And it then says, as defendant's pattern of conduct was defamatory and conducted with the intent to harass, it was criminal in nature and not protected by the veil of religious practice. It then talks about the stalking. It talks about being uh, physically harassed and surveilled by private investigators, private citizens, OSA members of Scientology and asks at the end of that, that they want a uh, judgment for that, which really would be mostly declaratory relief, but they're asking for compensatory and punitive damages as well. Count two is stalking under the California code. And yes, stalking can be brought criminally, but here it is being brought civilly. And this is going back to 2013, saying that there is a pattern of harassment here 
um, and a pattern of being followed and stalked. And that that pattern of conduct had last has lasted for over 10 years. Count three is the intentional infliction of emotional distress, the IIED. And remember for it to be IIED, we're looking for outrageous conduct. Um, and that's really the heart of this extreme and outrageous conduct that causes that emotional distress. They allege here that the course of conduct is extreme and outrageous and that plaintiff has suffered emotional distress. They don't get into it more deeply, but they do allege elsewhere in this lawsuit that she was on the verge of a psychotic break. I am sure there has been a tremendous amount of stress since 2013 that is probably very well documented um, privately and publicly through interviews, her book, and elsewhere. Count four is tortious interference with contractual relationship. Oftentimes in the cases I cover, there are vague allegations of this especially when it's between influencers, um, like this person contacted my sponsors or this person's audience contacted sponsors. But here you have a company affiliated with defendants, it seems, or an organization affiliated with defendants, it's alleged, directly contacting large companies and those large companies bringing it to the attention of Leah Remini's team. So there is a paper trail here that we don't always see in these types of lawsuits now one individual can sue another individual for contacting a sponsor or trying to get a contract terminated but here it seems like there is going to be a lot more of a paper trail than we see in most cases that i cover and i'm very interested to follow along with that because there were multiple contracts here with iheartmedia and audio boom and those contracts were well known they were published it was known what was going to happen and the letters are all tied back to one thing because they say exactly who they are and why they're contacting those companies. Count five is intentional interference with prospective economic advantage. This one is always a bit harder to prove, but there were negotiations going on between Remini and other groups. And because of the interference, they're alleging that that ceased. So a contract hadn't been signed yet, but this is where guarding the game show network and vice news and though they were in the middle of negotiations they pulled out and they're alleging it's because of the interference of these defendants which again is going to be documented because a lot of these things are done via email more documented than someone just being like we just don't want to touch it right now count six is defamation and defamation per se and then what I appreciate very much about this is they go and list the different things that are said within that one year statute of limitations for defamation in California. And again, the defamation per se helps, especially with a public figure, because you don't have to prove all of the damages because sometimes you can't prove those hard and fast damages when there is so much going on. So accusing people of crimes and things of the like can just be that defamation per se without showing tangible damage without having to do those damage calculations we saw at trial and like Depp v. Heard. They go on to say that there are statements accusing Remini of hate crimes, and then they list the different specific statements accusing her directly of hate crimes, including a tweet dated April 18th, 2023 from Hate Monitor, a Twitter account owned, operated, or controlled by the defendants that falsely stated, quote, on June 3rd, 2019, a man incited by Remini's hate speech murdered a 24-year-old Scientologist. At Leah Remini has blood on her hands. The tweet then refers readers to a Scientology-run standleague.org. They go on to say statements on social media that Ms. Remini supports rapists, um, statements on social media and defendant-run websites claiming that Remini is a religious bigot who has inspired praise of Hitler. It goes on to talk about allegations that Remini had her 18-year-old daughter involuntarily committed to a psychiatric facility. I don't know if that's going to be defamation per se on that one particularly. Count seven is defamation by implication. And again, this is not saying, you know, Leah Remini caused this crime or did this thing. This is leaving the implication that they did it. And this is statements accusing Remini of inciting hate crimes. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, five different statements listed similar to the per se allegations. Some of the same statements are reiterated here. Statements on social media that Remini supports rapists. Again, these are, um, some of them are Photoshopped images of Remini re leaving the impression that 
that this is something that she does versus saying it outright and a combination of the both. Statements on social media and defendant-run websites claiming that Remini is a religious bigot who has inspired praise of Hitler. So these same allegations, both in the per se allegation and in the defamation by implication cause of action. It says that defendants' decade-long crusade of abuses and attacks against Remini, including the defamatory statements made by defendants or defendants' operatives, have subjected Remini to public contempt, ridicule, and disgrace. And those are the standards, because again, defamation is a reputational crime, and sometimes you can show the financial outcropping of that damaged reputation. Sometimes you cannot, and that's where the defamation per se comes in, because accusing people of crimes and certain other things is considered so untoward in our society that it would naturally hold um, hold you up to public contempt, ridicule, or disgrace. Again, the languaging of these laws is a bit outdated, but it holds you up to that public scorn um, that they're talking about. The next count, eight, is false light. And this is, again, kind of a, a same wash of the defamation causes of action where we've got defamation, defamation per se, defamation by implication and false light. We talked about false light in the Cardi B, Tasha K case where it is leaving an overall impression of someone that is painting them in a false light, calling someone a, you know, a bigot when they are not, um, giving the society an overall impression that a person is one way, but they are not actually that. And so here they're saying such, um, here they are saying since 2013 and continuing to this day, defendants knowingly and willingly published or caused to be published statements about Remini as set forth herein on social media for public consumption. Such statements and negative publicity have placed Remini before the public in a false light that is and would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. So would a reasonable person on a jury be offended by saying that you support rapists and the rest of the things that the social media statements are saying about Remini. Count nine is the declaratory judgment asking the court to um, make a finding. So here they are asking for a finding that defendants maintain and implement a policy of abuse and attack against former members who speak out against Scientology. Upon departure from Scientology, an individual should not be stalked, harassed, targeted, or made to fear for their life or livelihood. Religious freedoms do not permit criminal or tortious behavior, tortious being civil wrong, civil wrong is a tort, nor may so-called religious doctrine or directives shelter the commission of crimes or torts against former members who exercise their rights to disassociate from or criticize an organization to which they once belonged. The abuse leveled at Miss Remini is part of a broader policy and practice of intimidation. Remini is just one of thousands of former Scientologists who defendants have terrorized as part of their systematic practice of fair game. The implementation of the suppressive person's policy as it pertains to Miss Remini and other former members or perceived critic of Scientology is unlawful. Therefore, Remini seeks judicial declaration that the practice of suppressive person operations are unlawful and should be ceased immediately. Plaintiff Remini is in doubt as to her rights and privileges with respect to the crimes and torts being committed against her by defendants and is entitled to have such doubt removed. There is a bona fide actual present and practical need for declaration of the rights of Ms. Remini. So she's asking for the court to say, you have the right to be free from this type of harassment. The problem I think they could run into with this, and I understand that if you could get a court to say, yes, this practice is unlawful, that there are parts of this practice that might be protected by free speech. There might be things that are opinion. Calling Leah Remini a horrible person is not going to rise to the level of defamation. So is everything in here unlawful? This is going to be a harder lift. I understand why they want to do it. But also the court can say, we know that harassment and defamation and stalking are all illegal. Like we know that these things are illegal. The court doesn't need to further declare that these are illegal behaviors. So of all of them, I think this is the heaviest lift. They're asking for punitive damages and um, a jury trial. And as I said earlier, there is a court date set for this. Unfortunately, the first date set in this case is in November 
of 2023 for the initial status conference. So what happens from now? Well, based on all the statements we've seen, I don't think this case is going to settle. I think discovery is a huge part of the point of this case, and discovery is going to be long and fraught. I think this case is going to take years to get to trial because of the discovery. I think there is going to be a fight for every deposition, every document turned over, and I think Scientology will use their resources to thoroughly throw litigation at this, from motions to dismiss, to motions at every turn, to fighting all of the discovery. This is a very long battle that Leah Remini is embarking on. So I'm going to put in the um, the substack and her statements about why she's suing Scientology, as long as a link to the entirety of the 60 four page complaint if you're interested in a background on that but i think we will see the church fighting discovery i think we will see them fighting that this is free speech and i think we will see them fighting saying we don't have control of all those twitter accounts we don't have control of what people do on social media people are allowed to voice their displeasure with a brand you can go to a brand and say hey i saw your brand donated to this um cause or campaign and we don't like that people are voicing their opinion and that's protected activity not tortious interference with contractual relations. We will see what happens. This one is not going to go away soon, and it is going to be long fought. Let me know all your thoughts down below. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a lawnard. It's time to raise a glass and say it with me. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May pumpkin spice be back at Starbucks. Like now, right now, I'm ready for fall. It's hot. Oh, God, it's hot. If you are in the group of us that have the earliest back to school in the world, may that go smoothly. May your family be well, and may the odds be ever in your favor. Thank you for being a Lawnard. I will see you in the next one. You can find more Lawnard goodness in our private Lawnard community over at lawnardsunite.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm covering, you can follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I recap those streams for those of you a little pressed for time over on the Quick Bits podcast and Quick Bits YouTube channel. Thanks for being a Lawnard.